Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the York series. Sitting within North Yorkshire, York is a very historic place with 31 civil parishes within its city boundaries. Here's one of them for your enjoyment. Welcome back to the city of York, everybody. Today, it's a wonderful, glorious, sunny day, and it's gonna show off this place in all its glory. I've just been out to the East Riding of Yorkshire, and I've walked around three very small villages, which you'll be seeing in the East Riding series soon. This is gonna feel like a little bit of a change from those, because this is a massive part of York, and it's centered around one specific landmark, and that is the university. Welcome to Heslington. Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. Here's a York Parish I've been looking forward to for a very long time. Don't be fooled by this intro, it might look a little too rural and bereft of anything to begin with, but I can promise you that's soon about to change. Welcome to Heslington, which is a village dominated by one major local landmark. Since the 1960s, the University of York has been located here. Complete with its 11 colleges spread over not just one, but two campuses, the University of York is a research university centered around a massive lake and the magnificent Heslington Hall, by far the most iconic of the university's buildings. There is a village here as well though, and we shouldn't forget that Heslington had been an established settlement for many years before the university came along. It still has all the usual village features like a pub or two, a shop and a post office, and even a village hall. It's also got a church, which is of a type rarely seen in the UK. Most of the walk here though is around the university and its colour-coded zones. There are countless interesting features within it, so this doesn't cover every last bit. It's had more than a few notable alumni over the years, too many to list, but seeing as we're on YouTube, the name Tom Scott might ring a bell for you. He's a fellow YouTuber who makes stuff like I do, only far, far better than I ever could. Mind you, he did go to a good university. Let's go and see how good it really is. We begin on School Lane, and at this point you do wonder to yourself exactly where the university is. Trust me, it's coming, but before we get to it, we first have to tackle another educational establishment. That would be Lord Derrimore's school. You can just about see it on the right here. It was still in use as a school until 2017, but currently the building is empty. It's being renovated and will soon become two new family homes. At least, that's the plan. Founded in 1795, the school began its life over the road in what is now an old school house. It was built on land given by Henry Yarborough, Heslington's Lord of the Manor. It moved into this Victorian building in 1856. The school is still active, and you don't have to go far to find its current building. Since moving out in 2017, it's been located in a modern £3 million building, just behind the old school building. It still has links to the Derrimore family too, a member of which still sits on the school's governing body. 
So you'd be forgiven for thinking that at the moment Heslington is just a normal village. We've seen a school and a few houses and behind me there's a scout hut. So you think to yourself, well, is this really a place that's got a university? Well, it is. We're just not there yet. Our next landmark is over the road and it's the church. Heslington's church is a little unusual in that it doesn't carry a dedication. It used to though, and some people still refer to this as St Paul's. Heslington Church is now one of the very few joint Methodist and Anglican churches in the country. This is what's known as a local ecumenical partnership. It was formed when St Paul's Church and Heslington Methodist Chapel combined their efforts in 1971. The old Methodist Chapel is now the village meeting room. Originally constructed in 1858, this building still looks like a Victorian parish church externally. It was extended in the 1970s by the ecclesiastical architect Ronald Sims, who removed the old north wall and added a modern suite of meeting rooms, including a vestry and a kitchen. The old choir and sanctuary now form a separate chapel. Services are held here every Sunday, and aside from the usual midweek meetings, the church also plays host to various university groups throughout the week. Now you may have noticed that the church door was actually open but we're not going into the church because there's a service going on and I don't really want to disrupt them. Instead I've come now into this wooded area which is sort of to the south of the church and we're heading onto University Road if we follow this path and you can see there we're already starting to encounter some university buildings. Let's go and find out what the University of York is all about. Now we're hitting the University of York. This is a massive site which covers most of the northern areas of the parish. It's a collegiate research university and it was established in 1963. It's since expanded to more than 30 departments and centres covering a wide range of subjects, but as universities go it's certainly got a very sciencey feel to it. Where we are here is its original campus, known as Campus West, which incorporates the York Science Park and the National Science Learning Centre. York was one of the first of the country's plate glass universities and today runs a distinctive collegiate system with 11 colleges as of 2022. The main campus spans either side of this road, University Road, and the two sides are linked by various footbridges, one of which we can see here. There are literally hundreds of buildings, so this walk will only pick out the most important ones. This for example is the library, which itself is split into five different buildings. So like every episode, I do have a planned route around the university, but it's so, so easy to get lost. I've already got lost once and had to refer not only to my planned route, but also to Google Maps to see exactly where I was. Let's see how successful the rest of this walk is going to be. That was the only time I was to get lost on this walk. From here on, you're aided by these maps of the campus. York is split into a series of colour-coded zones. York's first two colleges, Derwent and Langwith, were founded in 1965, the same year as the University Library. They were the first residential colleges and they were soon followed by Alcuin and Vanbrugh in 1967, the latter of which we're walking through now. Vanbrugh College is named after Sir John Vanbrugh, the designer of Castle Howard. The college houses the university's history, art, language and music departments. This green area close by is known as the Vanbrugh Bowl. Once past that we arrive at the campus lake, a huge body of water around which are the various zones. This is the largest plastic bottomed lake in Europe and was originally a marshy area that was drained and landscaped in 1964. It has a path that circumnavigates it and that's basically what we'll be following. So what my route effectively does is it goes around the lake catching basically every single zone going, um, most of them at least anyway. It feels kind of weird because these are actually public paths and I've got every right to be here but it feels very much private. I'm obviously not going to go into any buildings, any sort of um, student union buildings or anything like that or you know <laughs> I'm not going to trespass anywhere I shouldn't be. I'm just going to stick to these paths mainly. So let's carry on around the lake and see what else we can find.
Not long after its foundation, York was noted for its inventive approach to teaching. It was known for its early adoption of joint honours degrees, which were often very broad subjects such as history and biology. These broad subjects are very much still taught in the same way. Here in Zone 1, we're amongst the Biology and Environmental Sciences departments. Zone 1 is essentially Wentworth College. Founded in 1972, it was the sixth college to be founded here, following the fifth, Goodrick, in 1968. Now let's cross the lake on one of the many bridges that link the zones together. I picked this one specifically because of its design. It's what's known as a cable-stayed bridge, which means it has towers from which cables support the bridge deck. This one might not be Brooklyn Bridge, but both are designed in the same way. And it brings us into Zone 6, which is colour-coded blue. We're about to enter James College, which is sometimes known as York Sports College. Okay, we've come over the bridge and now we're in Zone 6. This is James College and the maths and science-y type blocks. So, away from the biology and environmental into another zone. Let's see what this one's got. James College was the seventh of York's 11 colleges to be founded, and it was so in 1990. It consists of 13 accommodation blocks close to the University Sports Centre. It was named after Lord James of Rusholme, the University of York's first Vice-Chancellor. Handily, there's a plaque here which tells you that fact. As well as being a sporty area, this also contains some more science-y type buildings. In front of us here, for example, is the Psychology Department. After ambling through the blocks, we then hit a road as we turn back north. That building there is the lounge, which is one of the bars that's run by the Students' Union. There are many others, namely the courtyard, the kitchen, the glasshouse and the Vanbrugh Arms. Next door is the University's Information Centre. And then we come to the Union building itself. This is often referred to by an acronym, USU, which stands for York University Students' Union. So despite the fact I do actually hold a degree, a 2-2 in BA Honours Education, I never got the opportunity to go to an actual university. My degree came from a college in Lincoln, which is tied to a university, but it's not actually like a, a university like this, a proper campus like this. It's like a, um, a satellite campus, if you like. Um, so I don't actually know what it's like to like, like live in a university campus. I imagine it's like really, really interesting to do so, and I never got the chance to do so, and I'm too old now to actually attend university I think and uh, actually experience it for myself so you know it's quite the thing quite the thing to be able to do that and of course the student union is where all the students go to have a good time I suppose but uh, unfortunately I never got that chance Next we have the Exhibition Centre, right next to the Students' Union at the heart of the University campus. This features a 900 square metre exhibition space, three tiered lecture theatres and six flat floored breakout rooms, four of which combine to create the exhibition space itself. Nearby is the Galleria restaurant. Around the back of the Exhibition Centre now, and here's the lake again, this time showing off its impressive fountain. Our next landmark building is Central Hall. It's a half-octagonal concert hall used for convocations and examinations, as well as theatrical and musical performances. It's a Grade 2 listed building. Household names such as Pink Floyd and Paul McCartney have performed in it before, but performances by big-name acts have been a little rarer at the university following an incident in 1985, during which the cover of its orchestra pit was damaged. That led to a ban on pop performances, and in particular, dancing. Now dotted all around the campus you'll find little sculptures and memorials. Here's one such memorial. I think it's a memorial anyway because it's for Saint Sir Andrew Derbyshire 1923 to 2016. Now this is just before we go across another bridge over the lake yet again and head for another area. Now obviously if I tried to find every single memorial and sculpture that this place has got I'd be here all day but they are dotted around pretty much everywhere so if you come for a walk around the university you never know what you're going to find just off these paths. Let's head over this bridge now and head for another part of the university. We're almost through it. Thank you. 
As you walk through Zone 5, effectively Derwent College, the brutalist architecture starts to fall away and it gives way to an area that wouldn't look out of place in a period drama. That's because we're approaching Heslington Hall, which is easily the university's most striking structure. These buildings were all once part of the hall's grounds and gardens. Here's another sculpture, a very totem pole-like affair, right next to the path that leads to the hall. After being taken over by the RAF during World War II, Heslington Hall remained unoccupied for a time afterwards. That was until it was sold to become the headquarters of the university in 1962. Its 18th century gardens were remodelled when the estate was incorporated into the university. It truly is a stunning building, and no mistake. The original house dated from 1565, but the building you see today was largely rebuilt between 1852 and 54 of red brick and magnesian limestone ashlar. Now, of course, one thing you have to remember about the university and about universities in general is that the campuses they sit on are big places and there's more to this than I've shown you. There's a sports area which is sort of behind Heslington Hall. There's a, an entire other campus out to the east which is called University Campus East and a whole host of other things besides. But I can't walk around it all because it is just too big. However, today's special section will cover all the bits that I think were still worth mentioning that I haven't walked to, and that's coming your way right now. Campus West has a few other bits I didn't walk to. For one, there's the huge sports area to the south of James College, which includes an athletics track. However, there's also a brand new sports area on Campus East too, which includes a purpose-built £1.1 million Olympic-sized outdoor velodrome, the only one anywhere in Yorkshire or the northeast of England. That handily brings us onto Campus East. This was built in 2009, with more than a little bit of opposition from the locals. In 2010, several departments moved into new facilities on Campus East, including the Department of Theatre, Film and Television, and the Department of Computer Science. In addition to the many buildings around the two campuses, the university also owns several other properties around York too, like for example, Constantine House. Students and staff are also able to use the Minster Library too in Dean's Park. This holds a huge collection of early books belonging to the Dean and Chapter of York Minster. Now let's not forget that Heslington was a village long before the university decided to sprout its roots here. And that village still exists and it still has a main street and lots of other villagey type features. And that's the last part of this walk, to head straight down Heslington's main street and see what the village is actually like. Main Street, as you might well imagine, is often busy because university students make use of its facilities. It has two pubs. Here's the first, named Charles XII. It also has a shop which doubles as a post office, and this is it. It used to, until very recently, have a bank too, a branch of Nat West. Unfortunately though, earlier this year, that branch closed and the premises is currently empty, as you can see in this shot. A bit further up the road, there's a popular sandwich shop named Brown's Bakery, and let me tell you, this smelt really good. Like any normal village, Heslington also has things for the locals too. Tucked away down an alleyway, you'll find a village meeting room, which used to be the Wesleyan Chapel, built in 1844. It's available to hire for events like any other village hall would be. And back to the road, we come to the other pub, the Derrimore Arms. I think it's fair to say that the university students have definitely got everything they need here, haven't they?
And last but not least, as you walk down Main Street towards the end of the road, you come across these, which are the Memorial Cottages, built in 1903. The, the plaque above the door, the stone above these two doors, reads, these almshouses were erected by Robert Lord Derrimore in memory of his beloved wife, Lucy. And aren't they pretty? They look quite nice, don't they? And it's a nice way to end the village of Heslington and the parish of Heslington too. A place that's dominated by the university these days, but really it's still a village at heart. It might be overshadowed by its biggest landmark, but quite frankly, if you come to Heslington Village, well, it's a world away from what you find literally just on the other side of the road. All in all, it's been a very interesting parish here in York, and it's time for me to move on to my next one. I've been Andy, also known as the Village Idiot. This has been the Parish of Heslington, and I'm out.